Hello, friends and neighbors. This is Pastor Stephen Wall coming to you again from St. John St. Peter Lutheran Church for another 10 minutes with Pastor Wall. You know, when I arrived at the first church that I served at, well, one of two, I was, uh, it was a dual parish, and, uh, but one of those churches, uh, Emmanuel Lutheran Church near La Crescent, Minnesota, had three letters over the door, the front door of the church. The letters were U-A-C. I have to admit, I, I didn't understand immediately what those letters represented. I assumed they must be important, and so I asked one of the, uh, one of the neighboring, actually retired pastor nearby, what those letters stand for. Now, obviously, they were important for the, the founders of that church to include those letters on the front of the church, and indeed, they are important. The UAC stands for Unaltered Augsburg Confession. That that was a church, a congregation, that would hold to the Unaltered Augsburg Confession as a statement of what they believed. Now, of course, that's actually true of any of our Lutheran churches in the Wisconsin Synod. We all hold to the Augsburg Confession. But what is the unaltered Augsburg Confession? Why do we have to add the word unaltered? Uh, Can't we just say that we hold to the Augsburg Confession? And we'll get to that after a little bit. But first of all, what is the Augsburg Confession? Well, the Augsburg Confession goes back to the year 1530. Remember, 13 years before that, in 1517, that's the year uh, when Martin Luther posted the 95 Theses, and the Reformation began. Luther, of course, never intended, never wanted to break away from the Catholic Church uh, and create a, a church of his own. Luther simply wanted to reform the Catholic Church. He recognized that there were uh, errors being taught in the Catholic Church. And Martin Luther wanted to address those errors, not the least of which was the selling of indulgences, which was going on in full in Germany at that time as the Pope was trying to raise money to build a massive cathedral in Rome. Fast forward 13 years. Luther has been condemned by the Catholic Church. Luther is considered an outlaw. Luther has the papal ban. He's been excommunicated by the Pope. And yet the Lutheran Church continued to grow and and to flourish. And over those intervening years, the Lutherans would more and more formulate what they believe, based not on the uh, declarations of the Pope, based not on the traditions of the Church, not based on the councils, uh, the Church councils, but based on, entirely on God's Word. And that was the foundation and the focus for the Lutheran theologians. What does God's Word say about it? Over time, even though the Lutherans would have loved to have a forum, a a, a church council in which they would be able to debate these, uh, these biblical issues in the Catholic Church, the Pope refused to call a general council. The Pope refused to uh, invite any kind of debate from the Lutheran theologians like Martin Luther or Philip Melanchthon or any of the others. However, on the political scene, there were outside forces at work that necessitated a coming together of the the leaders of the Holy Roman Empire, which was led by Emperor Charles V. The external forces in particular was the Ottoman Empire, the Muslim Horde, that was pouring into Europe, pushing forward into Europe, using force to try and uh, spread Islam. And 
that uh, the Turks then, the Ottoman Empire, had pushed forward all the way into Austria and was at this time threatening Vienna. And so Emperor Charles V saw the threat on the horizon, the threat to his empire, the threat to the people of his empire. And Emperor Charles V wanted to bring his empire together, wanted to bring them all together so that they might be able to hold off the advances of the Ottoman Empire. But because of the Catholic and Lutheran uh, factions within the empire, Emperor Charles V wanted to try and bring them together in unity. So it wasn't the Pope who called a general council, but it was the emperor who called a meeting of all the what we call the electors, the people who would uh, have the, the ability to elect who the emperor would, would be, including a number of German electors. And they all gathered at a place called Augsburg in southern Germany. As those princes gathered in Augsburg, the, the Lutheran princes in particular, they stood up for what they believed as Christians and as Lutherans. They stood up against Emperor Charles V. They were willing to take part in defending the empire. They were willing to uh, support the defensive efforts of Emperor Charles V. But they refused to back down on what they believed. They refused to give in to the demands of the Catholic Church to abandon these, these Lutheran teachings. And so at the Diet of Augsburg, you have a number of these, these Lutheran princes who stood up for their faith. That's a fascinating, fascinating bit of history because it wasn't the theologians who were standing up and saying, this is what we believe, but it was the leaders, the princes themselves, laymen, who led the charge in defending their, their faith. Now, they had the support, of course, of the Lutheran theologians. Martin Luther, however, was not at Augsburg because, because of the, uh, the papal ban against him, that he was excommunicated. In fact, he was considered an outlaw, and anybody could have killed him on, on, on the spot. And so Martin Luther stayed at a distance at a place called the Coburg Fortress, which was almost 100, year, 100 miles away. But uh, one of Martin Luther's fellow theologians, a guy by the name of Philip Melanchthon, traveled to Augsburg, and it was Philip Melanchthon who, who wrote the Augsburg Confession, defending the Lutheran faith, defending it against a lot of attacks, because the, the Catholics had done their best, especially this guy John Eck, had done their best to try and paint the Lutherans as, as, uh, as heretics, to try and connect the Lutherans with uh, heresies from the past that had already been condemned. And so, uh, in fact, one of those documents John Eck had written was 505 propositions against the Lutherans. And so uh, part of this Augsburg Confession was answering some of those accusations and seeking to declare clearly and plainly what it is the Lutherans believe and also the doctrines, the teachings that they reject, that they don't hold to, including all of those heresies that they had been accused of. Now, why do we call it the unaltered Augsburg Confession? Because even after those princes, those Lutheran princes, had presented the Augsburg Confession as a statement of their faith, which was accepted finally by Emperor Charles V, yet Philip Melanchthon, throughout his, the rest of his lifetime, continued to make changes and to tweak the Augsburg Confession, and sometimes not for the better. He, tried, he sometimes softened the, languages, uh, the language that he used. He sometimes uh, uh, acquiesced in, thing, in areas that, that he shouldn't have given in. And so uh, that Augsburg Confession that we hold to is not 
the one that Philip Melanchthon tweaked and changed, but the unaltered Augsburg Confession, the one upon which those Lutheran princes stood up and said, this is what we believe and you cannot command our faith. What an example for you and for me to speak clearly what it is we believe. And we're going to dig into this Augsburg Confession and see what it is the, the Lutheran princes stated uh, as their faith. And we're willing to stand up for their faith. In Romans chapter 10, we read this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. A reminder for us to confess clearly what we believe. This faith that we have in Jesus alone. Jesus as our Savior. Stand firm, brothers and sisters, in your faith. In the name of Jesus, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Curb those who by deceit or sword would seek to overthrow your Son and to destroy what he has done. Lord Jesus Christ, your power make known, for you are Lord of lords alone. Defend your Christendom that we may sing your praise eternally. O Comforter of priceless worth, send peace and unity on earth. Support us in our final strife and lead us out of death to life. 